Hello, uh, and welcome to Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. We are an online resource and community for up and coming screenwriters. And today we are breaking down the Danish film, The Celebration, or like Festen or something, I think is the original Festen. title. Right. Mm -hmm. I believe that's right. What a yeah. freaking choice, John. <laughs> you know how to pick him. <laughs> I mean, I have to, you know, I feel like part of my job here is to shake it up every every once in a while. I mean, we can't do bride, Bridesmaid, Bridesmaid 2, Bridesmaid 3, Bridesmaid. I mean, we just have to every once in a while throw in celebration. Every right? once in a while, you just got to wreck somebody's day. But I was reading <laughs> something. Yeah. <laughs> it's my job, and I do it the best I can, to the best of my abilities. But I was reading something earlier today that, that I thought was really interesting, and I want to share it. Uh, actually, I can't share it, but Alexi can share it. I was reading a, an interview um, with Alexi. Oh, nice setup. Uh, yeah, you didn't see it coming. Did you see it coming? I didn't no. see it coming. I knew it was oh, happening. Good. I didn't see good. it coming. Good. I got my touch. So, Alexi, I was reading this. Tell, uh, what was I reading, Alexi? You were reading an interview, my first oh. interview that I did. Wow. Yeah. About the uh, the Greek myth podcast that's out now, and they did a shockingly nice write up about it. And yeah, I'd love to share it. It's it's cool. It's been getting people have been liking it, which is a little like weird to see. It's better. <laughs> it's probably be weirder if they didn't like it. I guess I don't know. It's it's an interesting experience to have people talking about something in the world. But um, yeah, I can share the. I'll grab the link. Well, you're a good share. writer. Well, thank you. <laughs> and she's it, great. And she turns out she's a great interview. You, you, I, and I, I don't know how to phrase this without you know coming like a backhand comment. You, <laughs> you sound really smart. I'm so glad I sound smart because it's not. <laughs> I mean, Ron what I said, meant to "Who say, wrote this for you?" To say is you are really smart, and you sound really smart. It's a great interview. I so uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to be corny, but I I was so proud. Thank you. You got a little shout out. Did you catch that? No. At the very end. Oh, I got to go back and reread. I said my old course. professor and mentor. Oh, um, my and thank you for saying my old. Yeah, I know. I need a, a different word besides old, like previous. Old, I mean, old works. I mean, you can say old ball. Yeah, my old bald professor. Old, old art. Yeah. I realized I needed a better word than old, because, but like prior or like previous, it seems like I'm like still nearly dead. Yeah. One foot, one foot in the grave. Yeah. There we like go. That. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask for a, a edit on that one. Notice how I'm going dark to get in the mood for a celebration. Yeah, Is you got good? to. You got to like lower us in. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm loving these comments here and. Uh, <laughs> and Rick, and we've got some. Uh, oh wait, John, tell everyone, yeah. tell everyone where you are. Tell everyone where you are. Oh, I'm back. In, I'm finally back in my office. I'm back at NYU. Uh, this is my office. See, I'm he's back. real. It's I'm real. This wasn't a ruse. <laughs> Actually, um, did you it wasn't like, real, but I still have an office. What? <laughs> did you have to like wipe off a layer of dust off everything when you walked in? No, you know what? I mean, the fact is. I'm now, I'm so, they have been coming, I, they've been cleaning this office every week, I think, because I came in, it was spotless, and I thought, my God, I don't want to dirty the place up, maybe I should leave again. Um, but, you, should, uh, you should look for, like, hidden notes in your books. Oh, man. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I have, uh, these are, you know what these are? The, can you see these? These are all, this, these are kind of, I don't know, they're interesting. People um, like looking at your books. Share your students books. Students come in, well, these are all scripts. Oh, really? So, yeah, so these are all film scripts, and they are... Um, are they the four-year consideration copies? Yeah, so when you're oh. in the guild, um, can you see? I can't figure out which mm -hmm. way to turn. There you go. So they send these to Hang you. Hang on, let me make you... I'm going to solo you so people can see it better. Do it again. Do it again. There you go. Hold it sideways so we can see the titles. Other, Other sideways. There you go. Other sideways. <laughs> so anyway, Perfect. these are all... These are all um, mud, mud sound and spy and fences and la la land. And they're scripts um, uh, that the guild sends out. Here's a beautiful boy. And the nice thing about this is 
they're in script format so you could see what page um, they're on. Beautiful Boy is only 94, 95 pages long. Who knew that? Those wow, like booklets are some of the coolest things to read. I got to borrow a stack of them from, I think it was John Kane Maker. Let me borrow it. Or, uh, oh my gosh, what's her name? <laughs> I feel like Evelyn? No, no. What's her name? She I, does TV. She's great. Anyway. Jock, I don't know. No, no, no. Uh, I'll oh, figure it out. Oh, Little Women. Little, little. But those books are so much fun. Oh, Little Women. I don't know if you can see. Oh, they they the actually changes. have the color changes. Wait, so. Wait, switch it. Hold it back up again. Oh, I see it. So they, so yeah. the the red are um, rewrite pages. That's oh, cool. So that no, section um, is Little the Little Women. She had a very specific gimmick where because there's two timelines, one of them is red and one of them is black. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that right? Yeah. So 122 pages. Oh, so I see. Yeah, right. There's a note okay. at the beginning about it. Okay. So Have you read I think the script? these. I love this movie. It's a great movie. I, I don't think that these booklets are purchasable. I think that they're like you get them if you're in the guild or like if you're an Oscar voter, right? Yeah. So if you're a voter, you get the you get them, and then they all sit in the DVD. Ooh. You know what I miss? You know what hmm. I miss? I miss well, the the guy with the table outside of NYU who always sells sold the scripts. The yeah. sort he of had so out many PDF. scripts, and yeah. I was like, "What? Where did these even come from?" And they're all, all yeah, exactly. Where do and they they're come? all like findable on the internet as PDFs, and he just prints them out and sells them on the street. <laughs> it's a people, it's a good game. Buy? Do people buy? Oh yeah, I saw. Oh. I've seen them in so many dorms. <laughs> Really? I think it's okay. like one of those things like you get to NYU and you're like, yeah, yeah, I want to buy that script. And like, it's like <laughs> you can Google it for two seconds and print it out yourself. But, but go What's ahead. What's the fun in that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and by the way, it's a really good idea to read scripts. So I, I keep these in the office because sometimes students come in and they say, I loved La La Land. So I'll give them La La Land to read. And they say, I'll bring it back. And then they never do. That's kind of I almost did that. That's why I was, um, Hesitant to bring it up, but yeah, I borrowed like a stack. I got like Ratatouille and Wally, -E and um, that's where my scripts are, right? Alexa. And her, it wasn't from you. It was from the uh, the professor whose name I forgot. Well, maybe you blanked on her name because you have such guilt. Uh, from I spelling. well, so I I put them I all know. in like when I was graduating. I put them all in like a really like nice bag and wrote like a really nice thank you note. And I was like, so sorry, I've had these for two years. Butter, wait, what is this and, comment here? I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm being laughed at. Sorry, you had these scripts for two years. Uh, John can't hold the books far enough for his <laughs> classes. God <laughs> damn, it's a rough crowd. Uh, I'm glad I gave you Celebration to watch. Uh, so, By the way, I think it's a comedy. So how about that? Oh, is, wow. I mean, it there, is. it. I can see. There are funny moments. In it. There are. Um, by the way, people are asking, where is Adam? And I was going to make a joke that he was fired and try to do it really seriously, but... Then I decided that might be too much downness for today. So yeah, he's not fired. Them. He's busy. He got pulled into a last minute meeting and he might be joining us at like five, but maybe not. So it sounds a little like he got in trouble, doesn't it? I think. Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I kicked him out. He got he got he got called in the principal's office. He had a guess to do about this movie and he just can't bring himself to talk about it on camera. Yeah, he had a he like had the wrong opinion. He disagreed with me, so I didn't send him the link. So Michelle's right. I should have a log about students who take him out and yeah, you're right. I should do that. And you should way, have a look. If only way, John, I cared. John, what you're saying uh, about like it's a good idea to read scripts. I think you can't write scripts unless you read scripts. No, you can't. No, you it's can't. so important. No, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, why don't we get into celebration a little bit? Uh, wait, I thought oh, I thought Adam grew beard. This one. Uh, celebrate. Or lost his uh, hair. This isn't, this isn't oh. um, this isn't spring water, unfortunately. Oh. Uh, is that what he drinks? How do you know that? You don't know. Everyone knows that. That's like Everyone one of Adam's like defining personality traits is that he only drinks spring water harvested from the spring in Pennsylvania. <laughs> is that Lord, his only Lord, Lord of the Rings. Trait? Spring water. Is that his only character trait? That's like Lord, Lord of the Rings. Like, spring water. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. You're it's right. like yeah. <laughs> oh, my, oh my god, I'm late. Yeah, we've been having a lot of fun. So, let, Alexi, should we jump into this? We should. You go for it. There you go. Okay. Okay. Celebration. Um, let me go to my notes here. I've, uh, I I was 
say to Alexi and Avi before we came in the room uh, that I, I had the the kind of dumb luck of uh, seeing this film the Friday that it opened uh, in LA, and um, and and the reason that was good fortune is because uh, I didn't know what to expect, and so I kind of got hit with it full force. And, uh, you know, it hadn't been overhyped, it hadn't been underhyped, it hadn't been hyped at all. I didn't know, um, uh, I knew it was a Danish film. I knew a little bit about, I knew next to nothing about dogma. So I walked into the theater and sat down and watched this film and was just blown away. Um, so quick um, a little history on this. Dogma 95 uh, was a, a, a film movement that started in 1995 by, um, Lars von Trier and Thomas um, Vitterberg, and they had a manifesto, um, which they, they sometimes refer to as vow vowel chastity. Um, and they wanted um, to do stories that uh, were based on uh, traditional values of story acting theme, and they didn't want to be overly elaborate with special effects or technology. They wanted clean filmmaking um and i happen to love this uh i happen to love their approach i think um this was the first dogma film um uh Vitterberg is the director so um and one of the reasons that i i put this film on the schedule is um the style and tone of the piece so i'm going to go through this um it breaks with structure somewhat. I think when it does break with structure, it does it um, really well and for good reason. So um, uh, the film opens. Um, we meet Christian walking uh, down this country road, um, and quickly we begin to meet other guests. Um, one of the things that they've done, and this is again is the dogma piece of it of the puzzle. Um, the camera, the way they're shooting, um, a lot of steady cam and a lot of handheld. So you get all that um, that movement. It's chaotic. Um, um, cars are going by Christian and they're, they're, and they're screaming down this country road. Dirt and dust is being kicked up. We get a sense early on, and I mean two, three, four, five minutes in, that this is chaotic. There's just too much energy. Um, we also meet this wonderful character, uh, Michael, the brother, um, who is uh, well placed in the film uh, because Michael is the reason. Why is Michael in the film? Michael's in the film for for two reasons. One is he's he's wonderfully flawed. Uh, he's unstable. He's he's abusive to service people. We'll find out later that he's racist, uh, and he's a drunk. Oh, and he's an adulterer. So he kind of checks most of the boxes when it comes to flaws. Um, he serves the filmmaker well because, um, um, as I said, he's a ticking time. He's going to go off. He's going to explode at some point. And we know that from when we first meet him. Um, again, early stages, a lot of cars speeding up the road, going too fast. Um, the, 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 the director is saying, you know, danger, be alert. And by the way, you know, you guys aren't a normal audience or, or uh, not the standard audience because you, you watch this film and you go, okay, why is he doing that? But, but the, the, the typical audience, only knows that it's affecting them, that they're, they're being hit and emotionally they're, they're getting um, anxious. Um, we hear early that it's dad's um, 60th birthday party. Um, uh, we also hear kind of in passing um, that the sister's funeral had just taken place not too long ago. So there's a, there's a funeral. These pieces of story are brilliantly laid in. Um, they're, they're laid in subtly, they're with subtlety. Um, 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 they're not overstated. They're kind of 
sister funeral, and that's a big deal, but but in the early goings, not 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 a lot of attention is paid to it. Um, and, and as you guys, I hope, recognize, uh, the party is tonight. The party is tonight. So what is that? That's a ticking clock. We're going to, we, this, this, this film is going to be about, is, is going to be, be about a day long. Um, and so what we're, um, what we're building to is the party. And we, and we know that, we know that early. Um, and I'm, I hope, I'm, I'm going to call him dad. His, I don't know how to pronounce Helg, I, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna. So the father, we meet the Helga. father. Hel, Hel, what? Helga. Helga. We meet Helga and Helga. Christian. They, what? Helga. I, it's, it's okay. Helga. I think I better call him dad. But thank you, Ollie. Anyway, so um, uh, we C Christian. Christian has a quick conversation with Mia, the maid. Something seems to be going on there. Dan and, and Christian talk, and and again, all of this is very, very um, just laid in. I can't think of a better word. Just with such subtlety, um, Dan wants to know what Christian's plans are. Um, it's suggested that maybe Christian will take over this hotel, this inn. Uh, he says no, he's not. He's he's thinking about moving to Paris. Um, um, and then uh, about page 15, 15 minutes in, we meet again. I'm, I'm forgive me for these, for you know, chewing up these names. Helena, the sister, and she's in a room and she says, This is the room that their sister died in. She died in this room. So we meet Helena. Um, she's kind of looking around the room, looking for clues. Uh, we cut quickly to Michael, who's in a rage. Um, and there's a uh, uh, there's a beautiful moment early on when Michael finds out when they get to the hotel and he, he talks to the concierge and he finds out that his name's not on the list. They don't have a room for him. He hasn't been invited to his father's birthday, to his father's birthday party, and this just sends him over the top. Um, Helena. Uh, again, I hope I'm not going too fast, but there's a note. She finds her sister's note. She she says there's nothing in it, or she doesn't read it. She doesn't respond to it. Um, the, the, the sister's death and this note are kind of subplot B storylines um, that, that are um, really the way they're layered in is, is, is really strong because we've got so much going on in act two that we, that we go away from these things for a while. But again, imagine if the filmmaker had not made the choice to say, okay, there's a note. We know about a sister's death. We, we get that, we get that established up front first act. Then we can move into chaos. So, um, um, sisters, no, what else do I want to say that? Uh, that's about all. Um, there's a quick conversation, almost 30 minutes in, the first act's a little bit long, but almost for, uh, 30 minutes in, when dad talks to Michael, clearly dad's looking for somebody to take over the hotel, um, and, and Christian has said no, so he you know, turns to Michael, and he says, Michael, he says, you'll have to learn how to behave yourself. Uh, which, as we know already from Michael's beha behavior in the first 30 minutes of the film, that's a long shot. Uh, but Michael's game. He's, yeah. Um, Michael's got a wonderful art. I'll get into more of that later. Um, the pre-party, Michael starts drinking. Uh, we're back, in, and they cut away from this, but every once in a while, but they, there's a lot of handheld camera. There's a lot of steady cam. Just just to give it that energy. Um, and then on page 30, um, the Toastmaster begins. Um, Dad speaks. And when Dad's speaking, we punch in tight on Christian. There's a tight one on Christian. So something's going on here. We don't quite know what, but something's up with Christian and Dad. Um, uh, a great little sub plot beat the waitress is going around and, and one of the waitresses and she pours water into Michael's lap. So, 
and he goes off the rails. He's angry. He's shouting. So clearly there's a problem between this waitress. We'll find out more about that later. Again, just lay, just lay in there. The waitress is out to get Michael. She pours water in his lap. And then, boom. Page 34, Christian gives the toast. Um, uh, so let me go to some kind of technical aspects of, of, of the story. Um, Christian is a protagonist. His objective is to take down his father. It's just fantastic. Um, we know he's got one night to do it, and he's going to try to kill off his old man. Um, for those of you who are thinking, is, is this the inciting? The inciting incident happened years ago. That, again, is a really smart choice. Um, and um, Christian says uh, his dad, uh, dad had his baths. He says, dad had his baths, and he was very clean, and he took a lot of baths, and we took them. And then finally, uh, page 36, he said, he raped us. Um, so he's going after the old man. Um, right after this explosion, the, the, the crowd, one of the, one, one of the other great things about this movie, and again, it's a phenomenal choice. You know, as, as you've heard me say, there are no arbitrary choices when you're designing a story. There are no, no whimsical, ah, I don't know. The idea that this is a black tie affair, the idea that it's a very elegant dinner party, adds to the disparity of what's going on in the room. So you see these very elegant, all very attractive people in black tie and gowns and that you think oh god they're all going to be so well behaved because they are well behaved they're they're sophisticated people and then they blow the whole thing up so i think the choice uh and again you know again if you're designing a story at some point you might think oh i don't know is it is it you know is it held in a barn is it held you know but the again is Beautiful room. Um, uh, this terrific. The setting is beautiful. The people in, in black tie. It all works to give you a uh, um, kind of counter to what's happening in the room. That everything is getting. Everything appears to be so beautiful, and yet everything is so ugly. Great contrast point. Um, he raped us, uh, and people again are so. They kind of don't really respond to this. Um, uh, they kind of, oh, that was that was troubling, and let's move on with dinner. You know, please pass the wine. A lot of wine going. A lot of wine going through here. Uh, uh, um, even Helena, she she denies what Christian said. Uh, Christian leaves the room, and a, 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 I'm going to try to quit using the word subtle, but a beautiful kind of piece of business here. Kim, the chef is actually the mentor. Um, Christian and he obviously go way, way back. Um, and Christian says, I, I heard what happened. I know what's going on. They talk. Uh, Kim is supportive. And at this point, remember, Christian, your protagonist, is out, out on his own. He's way outside the group. He's done something. He's crossed the line. Um, Page forty-two or so. Uh, Dad and Christian talk. It's it's it's. There's no real resolution there. And then again, going back to Kim, the mentor, he goes to his staff and he says, "Go to the rooms, steal all the car keys. We'll hide them so no one can leave." And he says, "It is Christian's turn tonight." That's a great mentor. Um, he's there. He's supportive of his parents. Um Page 46, another, and, and one of the things in, in Act 2, and we know that Act 2 is, is, is the, the, the difficult act to write because it's so long. Um, they keep layering in new business, and all of that new business creates more conflict. 
So uh, here's another name. I'll be have to sh help me on this one. It's it's spelled G B A T O K A I. Let me get back to you know. on it. Yeah. Anyway, he's Helena's boyfriend. He shows up. Uh, Michael meets him getting out of the cab and assumes, because he's a black man, that he's a musician and tries to send him away. So again, Michael is just horrible. Um, this uh, Helena comes out, she explains he's with me. Um, there's some pushing. So, I mean, the, the other thing is that this whole, the altercations get very physical um, and they keep escalating. Um, uh, so again, more, more fuel to the fire. Um, uh, and when back at the party, um, Christian talks to Helena's boyfriend and, and Christian breaks down and starts crying. The, the amount of wine consumed in the story is just pushing everything because people are becoming more and more. Um, unglued, and people are becoming drunk. So we know, again, I, I said this about Michael, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a time bomb. We know this is only this is going to go off the rails. Uh, it's it's like you you know you put a, a guy in a car, and uh, you put a six pack of beer in the passenger seat, and when the movie starts, he pops the first one. It's not going to go well. So same idea. Um, about midway through the film, um, Christian's mother uh, uh, um, gets up to speak, and, and she does this wonderful thing. She seems kind of disconnected from everything. And when she talks about her, her children, um, almost as if she doesn't recognize what she's saying, she talks about how they have all failed. Uh, we do learn, and it's an important piece of information, we do learn in her speech that Michael was not living at home when his father's uh, misdeeds uh, were realized on Helene and Christian. Helena and Christian. Uh, he was away. Michael was away at boarding school, so he knew nothing of this apparently. Um, and uh, she, uh, mom, mom demands an apology for, from Christian. Um, this is, I think I missed one, but this is Christian's third toast. Now this is tricky. And, and when I was watching it again, I've seen this film several times. Uh, when I was watching it just the other day, I thought, wow, they're going to give him a third toast. As a writer, when you're approaching that, you, you think, okay, can I do this? Am I, is it redundant? Uh, of course it's redundant because they're all the same, basically the same content with each speech. So the, what you have to do is you have to keep ramping up, you have to keep ramping up the, the, the diatribe or the, the uh, accusations of the speech. Um, and that's what happens. So when Christian gets up for the third time, um, uh, he... Um, Again, attacks his father. Again, his objective is to take is kill the old man, kill the old man off. Michael, Michael then comes after Christian, and they fight. This is this is just great stuff. I mean, again, we're we're a, a better than halfway through the film. This fight continues outside. There's a chase. Uh, there are guys that come along with Michael. Uh, they finally catch Christian, and they tie him to a tree. Again, what are you doing in the second act of your protagonist? You're making it impossible for them to achieve their objective. So they tied him to a tree in the woods. He can no longer pursue his father and try to knock off the old man. Um, uh, Kim steps in here. He doesn't know where Michael is, but he grabs one, gets one of the perpetrators and locks him in a wine cellar. Uh, so he's still working for, um, uh, and Helena's looking for Christian. Nobody knows where Christian is. And then, and this is confusing to me, I don't know how, quite how it happened. I, I need to watch this film one more time. Um, but Pia, the maid, has the note. And she gets the note into the Toastmaster's glass. Uh, Christian, 
gets gets his hands untangled from the and 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 um, this moment. I, I'm just bear with me for one second. This moment when he gets untied, when he unties himself. You know, we've all seen a protagonist tied to a something. And then it turns out there's a broken bottle and he gets that piece of glass and kicks it around and kicks it around behind him and it gets it in his fingers and then saws away at the rope and gets free or some version like that. Um, as in keeping with the dogma approach to filmmaking, Christian just gets loose. He doesn't, there's nothing magical. There's no, oh my God, he was carrying a knife in his pocket all along. They don't go there. They, he, he wiggled and wiggled and finally he's gotten free. And now he's returned, um, he's returned to the party. Also, it's very economical film. It's all shot pretty much in this one house. Um, and when he returns, Helena is, she reads the note. And the note is um, the sister's suicide note. And there's just a great line in there, which is, you know, which is devastating uh, as the whole film is. But it's um, the sister writes, um, dad has begun again. This 80 pages that we're, we're late in the film now, now it, these things are starting to resonate with the rest of the guests. Uh, that, oh my God, maybe this is true. Um, uh, guests try to leave, but they can't, they can't find the keys to their car, so nobody can leave. Um, um, now the curious thing, I would argue, and I'm wondering know what other people think, that this moment, um, when when the sister's suicide note is read again plays so well in act one sister's death note and now act three suicide note read aloud by helene it's a very counterintuitive choice that helene would read it as opposed to christian the protagonist reading it um i mean it kind of registered for me and yet i thought it was authentic uh, uh, I'm sure that in story meetings there was a conversation, should we have Christian read it? Remember, he's made three speeches. It feels right to me that they made this choice, even though it's a little unique, a little unusual. Um, uh, and that is the ultimate test. Somebody now has, you are responsible for your daughter's suicide. This should kill the old man off. Uh, it's brilliantly played, um, and um, then there's some singing and dancing, some more chaos, um, and we, we find out um, that Michael has disappeared, and Christian passes out on the floor, there's, everybody's drunk, there's dancing, and then we smash cut to breakfast the next morning. Oh, there, no, there is one other really wonderful beat. Dad says, bring me some port. And dad is the is the patriarch of this world, right? Literally and figuratively. He's, and he says, bring me support, and no one will respond to him. It's a great moment because, for me anyway, what it suggests is that he no longer has a voice, that he is dead. He says, bring. Up until that point, everything he demands, he gets. Um, he's, the, he's, the, he's the lord of the manor, literally. And, but now when he says, bring me port, I said, bring me, nobody responds to him. He is, for all intent and purpose, dead. Um, breakfast the next morning, wrapping things up. Um, uh, the, the maid approaches Christian and he says, I'm going to Paris. Will you come with me? She says, yes. And Dad gets up to speak, and this is a really interesting choice, and I, 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 I think it works 100%, but it's a curious choice. Dad gets up to speak, <coughs> excuse me, and Michael goes to him and says, you have to leave. And Michael takes their father out of the room. So Michael, in the final fight, removes the father. Should it be Christian's choice? 
Perhaps. Yeah, yes, you would say so. Uh, but but the fact that Michael does it, it, it indicates that Michael, the most flawed character in the movie, maybe has resolution. We know that Christian's not going to take over the end. Elaine was never offered it. So maybe, and, and I don't, God knows, uh, they're not trying to put, you know, wrap this up in a, in a, in a big, big ribbon, uh, big happy ending. It's not that at all. Uh, but we think that Michael, maybe Michael can, maybe he's got a future because prior to this, God knows he did not have a future. The resolution is Michael's. Perhaps he has changed. Um, it's such a unique film. It, it's, it, it's a lot of it feels like doc style. Uh, anyway, that's my breakdown. I'm curious to know what, what people thought and, uh, and hopefully it wasn't too big a down. I think it's important to, it's, it's important to know about the dogma films and, and the films that, uh, Richard Berger and these, and these guys make. So okay. Alexi, can we, yeah. thank you. Can we go back to, uh, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Oh, oh I'm going to go back. What did you want to go back to? I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I was yeah. just, you know, um, so yeah, what, uh, that was a really good breakdown. It's a tough one. Um, and something that was Thanks. Thanks. that yeah. was like apparent to me in the in the like in your breakdown and then like in the chat too was um first I think we should look at the dogma ninety five thing briefly, just so we can see like what the rules are for everybody. But um actually let's do that first. Here I have it pulled up. Yeah, pulled up okay. Thank you for these nice yeah. So this is the Dogma 95 Vow of vow Chastity. Of chastity. Mm -hmm. So these are their rules <laughs> if you're going to do a Dogma 95 film. Shooting must be done on, on location. Props and sets must not be brought in. If a particular prop is necessary for the story, a location must be chosen where the prop is to be found. Wow. Sound must Love never it. be produced apart from the images or vice versa. Music must not be used unless it occurs in which the scene is being shot. So that's a diegetic versus non-diegetic sound. Basically, if it's not being picked up by the camera in the moment, it's not in the film. They're not going to go like add sound effects yeah. later. Camera must be handheld. Any movement or immobility um, attainable in the hand is permitted so you can get like zoom that you can like move it around but you're not going to do like a dolly shot yeah um, you, and you would never use a yeah exactly yeah. like no tripod or cranes or <laughs> stuff yeah. like that aesthetic uh, yeah uh the film must be in color special lighting is not acceptable if there's too little light for exposure the scene must be cut or a simple lamp can be attached to the camera so hmm. natural lighting that was the most obvious to me i think yeah, it's like yeah. sometimes i'm like this it's poorly lit too dark but, and sometimes yeah. it's a little bit out of focus and i will i think it adds to the tone and style of this yeah i think it works it, i was just like at first i i didn't know what dog 195 was going into this and when it started playing i was like is this a freaking like home movie <laughs> like is this a home video like what is this but um I think as it went on, it's a family. Like, it's a family film. It's a family story. And it's a family film, home movie, yeah. right? There you go. That's true. Um, so then, optical work and filters are forbidden. I think optical work means like special effects. Yeah, like special effects or like going in there and like stylizing it. Um, the film must not contain superficial action. Murders, weapons, etc., must not occur. I'd say that they were a little, hmm. they veered into this a bit with the violence. Like there was quite mm -hmm. a bit of violence, especially from Michael against the, uh, I feel the like staff worker. I feel like there are a lot of weapons and murders in the world that I would not call superficial. I guess that's what it is. Is it superficial or not? It's just interesting that they called it weapons murders. Yeah, that's interesting. I want, I'd like to hear them talk more about what that means. But I guess, John, you pointed out that it was like he didn't, like, find a bottle and, like, saw the ropes off. He just kind of, like, wiggled loose, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, um, temporal and geographical alienation are forbidden. That is to say, the film takes place here and now. So 
you're not gonna set it in the future or the past or like in some like place that doesn't exist. It's all there's a dream sequence. Oh, there is a dream sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They cheated. They yeah, cheated. Mm. Yeah, you're right. There's a dream sequence, which by by the way, I didn't think worked, but yeah. Um, genre movies are not acceptable. Oh, boo. Boo, Avi's out. I, mean, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think Gollum is a genre unto itself. Yeah. How, how dare they? <laughs> um, and then the film format must be Academy 35 millimeter. It's yeah. like the the literal like style of film, in case anyone right. was wondering. Uh, and then lastly, the director, well, not last, the director must not be credited, although that's a little, I guess they weren't technically credited, but we all know who he was. And then... <laughs> Um, furthermore, I swear as a director to refrain from personal taste. I am no longer an artist. I swear to refrain from creating a work as I regard the instant as more important than the whole. My supreme goal is to force the truth out of my characters and setting. I swear to do so by all means available and at the cost of any good taste and any aesthetic considerations. Hmm. Tense. That's a... Uh... Yeah, I feel I feel like we can have a a a book we about a whether or not discussion. that's coherent philosophically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's interesting. It's like basically, it's like I'm doing a. It's almost more hands off than a doc, like less affected than a doc. You know, like arguably, yeah. I mean, there's a, yes. I mean, one of the things that that I uh, and again, one of the reasons I thought it was important to know uh, this film and to watch this film. Is it, it was stylistically and, and, and the approach. Um, what they what they've done with this with these rules. Um, the, for instance, the, the the flip the reverse of this would be Iron Man or Wonder Woman or something. When you know nothing's real, so you and 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 um, I know I'm gonna get a lot of kickback on this, but superhero movies because nothing's real. It's like getting, it's like going to an amusement park. Um, and as you probably figured out, I'm not, that's not really my thing. But so this film, the fact that th these choices um, um, take us into the world. And, and I find that I'm believing the world. I said earlier, it feels a little doc like. Um, because I believe this is happening. I, I think we're watching this family because there's no moment when um, when there's a drone shot, there's no moment <laughs> when uh, something snaps me out of it, and one, and there's such it creates such intimacy, such intimacy that I'm uh, the, the behavior of these people is just breaking my heart. It's just it's horrible, it's horrific, but I and I'm believing it. Uh, Mirko pointed out, if I remember correctly, this film received quite some criticism for breaking the superficial violence rules in some of the fist fights. Hmm. Um, I think and also right. the point this is a valid point I think from Michelle dogma feels kind of gatekeepy this is what real cinema is I think I would I would say like I appreciate the challenge that dogma 95 set up sets up but like what I don't necessarily appreciate is anybody who would say that this is the only way to make good art like I think it's like a cool thing to try but I don't think it's like <laughs> I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't think it's, I'm not, too, but one of the things that you would do, for instance, if you're getting ready to make a film, and Alexi, I'm sorry, you've, you've, you've completely ruined me. I just have to go to Winter's Bone. But um, where's, if you're going to make Winter's Bone, you would have your, your um, cinematographer, uh, who would already be aware of this film, but you would, you would look at this film to draw inspiration and choices. Um, and they did. Because it's, it's, yeah, huh? Oh, I was gonna say, like, it's not, sorry, I can tell you about yeah. Winter's Bone in a moment. <laughs> 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 they yeah. they uh, used, I mean, it's like, it's a version of this, right? That's like, it's, yeah. Yeah. they used real right. homes. They didn't yeah. make sets. Yeah. All the costumes were borrowed from people who lived there, and they like gave them like new clothes in exchange for their clothes, so they could use them as wardrobe. A lot of like everyone that wasn't a lead was somebody who lived there. Um, so it's sort of like an interesting like in between 
like like inspired by dogma sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean the white. Florida the Florida Project, for instance, the Florida Project. You know that Baker knows this film, and again, that's why I bring this film up because and and want you to watch it because if you're going to write a script that's in this vein, in this genre, in this deeply reality based, then you be, need to be aware of these films, Florida Project, all of these films that are making these choices. Um, it's interesting it's to me. It's very specific. Yeah. Oh, it's, it didn't mean to cut you off. Um, it, it, it's interesting to me the idea of we are going to divorce any sense of personal point of view or aesthetic when there are like there's a shot in this movie that really sticks in my mind where it's right after christian um sort of fails to take down his father the first time and he's sitting in the kitchen and he's and he, he's in the foreground his face is in profile and the camera's kind of slanted it's a little bit on a you know in a dutch angle kind of situation um and in the background helga shows up he walks down a flight of stairs so half the frame is christian's face in silhouette and half the and half the frame is out of focus helga is approaching and that's an aesthetic, right? That is a choice in how to frame a shot for maximum yeah. dramatic impact. So it's it's an interesting experiment. I, I had a thought earlier today of how interesting would it be to, this might be sacrilegious, but I think it's kind of interesting from an experiment point of view, to remake these films in a sort of more standard aesthetic because that gives you the control part of the experiment. Can you get mm -hmm. to that sort of level of uh, mm -hmm. perceived authenticity if you're taking liberties with reality a little bit more. Like, I, I wonder I wonder if that might be useful just from a, uh, I guess just sort of a development of film point of view. Like, does the experiment hold up if you can actually compare it to something? Well, and again, that's I think it's why it's important to know these films because it, it can impact choices that you're gonna make. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's kind of, I mean, people are using, the word pretentious is floating around in the comments and I would definitely, <laughs> second that it, it is like kind of like it's interesting because they're trying so hard to create something that's like not pretentious like they're trying to create something that's completely unaffected as unaffected as a scripted thing can be mm -hmm. but that choice is making it very affected and like by like saying i'm not going to put any aesthetic on it you're putting an aesthetic on it like it's <laughs> you know it's like it's kind of like inescapable anytime you create a frame like right. what you choose to put in the frame is a choice. You can't eliminate choice. Um, yeah. If anything, it, it just sort of proves that it's impossible to, I guess, remove the artist from the art. You mm -hmm. know, like like no matter how hard you try, you you know you if you, so long as there's any sort of structure to what you're showing us and any sort of intent of why is this actually it? Why are we looking at this? Why are we having this scene, why does this character exist? If there's a reason behind any of them, and it's a defined reason, you can't you can't say that there's no point of view behind it. And I think that's fascinating. You know, I think that something really interesting is I've seen people start experimenting with this, sort of like the, the Sleep No More vibe, which if you're unfamiliar is a play experience, like a Shakespeare thing in New York, where you go to a hotel and basically the play, I think it's a hotel, right? And the play is yeah. happening in the yeah. hotel. Around you. Around you. So you're in it in a mask and you're following the play and you can choose which characters to follow because there, there's things happening all over the place and you are just in the hotel and you can choose which plot lines to follow or not. And so in that way, you've removed the frame. And I've seen people try to do that with some like, experimental films where they shoot... Like you had basically like each character was followed with a camera and it was like an interactive thing, like where you as the viewer could click between the points of view and follow mm -hmm. different characters and see different parts of the story. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like that's like the next level of this that like tries to remove the like, like forcing a specific interpretation on it. And I think, I think it's, it's not necessarily like the kind of thing that I would want to tell. I don't think. But I think it's really interesting. I think it's yeah. you know what could have way. what could have shattered this movie's sense of supreme reality is if they had a single performance that was anything less than solid, because they could have had bad luck with their casting and gotten a cheesy Helga or a 
very theatrical Michael, because Michael is so over the top already. Imagine if they had somebody who couldn't sort of find the authenticity in that and played it for camp. You know, yeah, it would, it, it would have been so difficult. Good. Yeah. Yeah, um, you're, you're right. Yeah. But, I imagine but, that that must have been kind of a like traumatic set. Like I, I would imagine <laughs> that it, it's probably hard <laughs> to like harder than usual to take a step back from the subject material when they're I trying really so hard to like do it unfiltered. Right. Well, there's no set, yeah. right? There's no that you yeah. can't look at lights or anything. You're just in the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the way, just talking about the tone of it. I, it's it, there's definitely a version of this that isn't a comedy, right? This is, I mean, it's 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 a dark comedy, but it is a comedy. And I think if they had done sort of the straight dramatic version, where everybody's sort of po faced and there's a sort of faux sense of ponderousness to make it feel serious, it would have undercut what they're trying to do. It would have undercut the reality of it because humans are funny, and humor can be a defense mechanism. And sometimes it's just the absurdity of the situations you find yourself in, no matter how. In, intense they get and i think this movie captures that really well and really and that's part of why it's so uncomfortable to watch there's no there's no filter of any kind it's it's it, like one thing that I, I love about the horror genre right is it lets you look at tough topics um through a sort of a lens a sort of a filter there's no filter here it's just it's just full force blast to the face shotgun and it's uh it's a lot it's a lot yeah sure. it's it's um Absolutely. And, you know, one, I'll throw out a word that I know it's a dirty word, but, you know, it's manipulation. So yeah. we are when we we are, that's what we're doing. We're manipulating. We're, we're saying, I'm going to show you these 60 some story beats. I'm deciding which story beats to show you. And I'm sort of decided what order to show you these story beats in. And therefore, when I'm telling the story, I am, I've decided what to take out. What I, and yes, so what we do is manipulate. What they're trying to do is take out the manipulation mm -hmm. or the obvious manipulate. They're trying to make it as, as. They're trying to make us yeah. forget that we're being manipulated. That reminds yeah. me of, yes. um, there was like this campaign on, that was in the New York subway system for a while where I can't remember who did it but the, it was like a clothing or makeup or something ad where they used models, but did absolutely no digital touch up on the models, uh -huh. which was like surprisingly jarring because like, even if things like don't look touched up, they're very, very, very touched up. And it was actually like very, like people found it like surprisingly like unsettling because it almost felt, like I heard it called like pornographic. It, it's, it wasn't, but it felt like very, very, um, it makes people uncomfortable when you're used to seeing something filtered, even if it's like the illusion that it's not. Like kind of like if you, if you see someone wearing like natural makeup all the time, you think that that's what it is. And then they take off their natural makeup and then people think they look sick. It's a joke. You know, yeah. like it's yeah. like, it's like that, and I think that that is. This is without the makeup. By the way, here's a here's something nobody would sign on. This is my this is my idea for a weekend weekend uh, film immersion. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? The Florida Project and Celebration. So you see those. <laughs> you have to be. You have to pass an emotional stability test before you're yeah, allowed to but, participate. But, but you see <laughs> how they're. The, the, how the choices, the filmmaking, the sty stylistically, how they're all working to the same, hopefully, end result. They all had the same, similar, similar uh, idea in mind or in terms of um, reality-based story. Well, you know what's interesting? You bring up the Florida Project, and something I, I noticed in this film is it's very objective point of view. Like we are bouncing around, looking at all these different people, sort of from the outside, and the Florida Project as realistic as it is, we are looking through the eyes of those kids. And we are, and that is a sort of a filter. So it's an interesting comparison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and the fact that Baker used the real hotel, there were people living there and all that. That's fantastic. Uh, Abishai, what's the name of the horror film that the three, it was a big hit years ago, the three kids, the three or four 
they go into the woods the headshot doc, doc style kids oh the Blair Witch Project Blair Witch Project Blair, oh. I haven't seen it in years but the Blair Witch Project yeah like found was, footage is like a a like cousin of this it seems like because it's trying to create the feeling that this happened but usually right. it's not right yeah. the thing the thing that's interesting about found footage to me is even though it's recreating reality aesthetically the part of why found footage horror movies are so scary and i do i do love a good found footage horror movie is they are so narrow in their point of view right like here you know in in the celebration we are bouncing between each of the siblings and the people working in the kitchen and uh, you know the Toastmaster and all that. Found footage stipulates that there's a character holding a camera and that is their eyes. And we are looking at it through this narrow lens and there could be monsters on either side of the camera that we're not seeing, but we only see what our character sees. And that's incredibly immersive and puts you in a single person's sort of view line. Where at, like, which, which I think is a different kind of manipulation, right? Because then it's, you are there and you are limited. And here in the celebration, you're kind of unlimited. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be interesting when, I mean, it's inevitable, it's it's happening soon. I don't know how soon, but like when you inevitably do have like VR, AR style films where you're able to like look 360 around you and decide what you wanna look at and the thing is happening with you. And I think it's interesting, it's, That'll be really interesting to see, like what kind of what that's like as a yeah. viewer, and like what people can do with it, where you like make the frame so big that you can't see everything in it at once. Um, totally, it'll be um, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, kind of thinking about the the sister being the one who reads the note, I had a few thoughts on that. Um, yeah, because. Mm -hmm. First, my, my thought was sort of just about how Christian has no credibility with his crowd, right? They've already invested so much in assuming that he's a crackpot. But what what, it, what I'm really interested to talk about is the importance of subplots. Because, you know, I was thinking while watching it, it's like, okay, we have Michael with his abusiveness and with his cheating and with his history with that, with that woman. And now you have the, the abortion. Sister. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, the abor there's the abortion. Then you have the uh, you know the sister brings her boyfriend who is black, and everybody's incredibly racist to him. And while watching, I'm like, I'm thinking these are very intense subplots. How are they going to pay off in our main plot? And the way that her subplot with her boyfriend pays off is she is sick of everybody in that room, and she is primed and reached a point to where leave. she not but not just to leave to read the note. Right, because uh, er, cause uh, early right. in the story, she says she won't read the note. Well, she not only does she, will she not read the note, she'll hide it. But she'll, but even after Chris, uh, Christian says what he has to say, she says, "Oh, I love my brother," but you know that's not that's not true. Not true. Right. But she has she's brought to a place emotionally where she needs to push back against everything in this room, and I think that's why it feels so satisfying because it's not arbitrary. It's like you said, they've been priming us for this point in the story the entire time yeah and and those 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 pieces i know i'm repeating myself those pieces are wonderful they're, yeah they're laid in and they the fact that they <clears throat> excuse me that they lose them that with their they that the, any conversation about the sister drops out of sight for about 40 50 pages but the fact that when it was laid in it was laid in brilliantly it was just a couple beats act one and now that's that's you know for me that's when i'm i know i'm in the hands of a great storyteller and and that's certainly yeah. The case. yeah i was really really impressed by the way that this film like handled people's response to christians um like first toast and then how everything unfolded from since then like it felt very like unfortunately authentic to me and it felt very like relevant to a lot of the things that we're seeing in the media with like me too and like things like that where you know people are pushing back against it until you can't you yeah, know right, right and it it i was just i was really impressed by that and i think that you know if you were gonna do something in this dogma 95 style i think that this was a, a good 
story to tell for that, like showing how that happens. Um, oh imagine if Vinter, if, um, if uh, what's his name, Vinterberg. Um, imagine if if Vinterberg had not done his research and put all of this work into doing something that's so blisteringly unfiltered and raw and real, but missed the mark with representation of um, uh, survivors of abuse because this is so research. Like you can tell that he knows exactly, first off, what the sort of behavioral repercussions are of experiencing that trauma as a child. And also of the way that people push back, they're doing it through so much rationalization and denial and just so much anger when he keeps trying to bring it up just because they are so invested in Helga as this pillar of the community and a pillar of the family that the second they even entertain the idea that he might have done something monstrous, it affects their entire worldview, right? Mm -hmm. That's, it's done in such a real way. And it reminds me of cults and how yeah. you know, there are people who, yes. if you try to get somebody out of a cult, there is a danger that they might just dig in deeper because it is easier to sort of embrace that lie than accept that you've been told something wrong for so long, you know? It's like um, you get these like goggles, like these like lenses, like this way of viewing the world that lets everything make sense to you and be comfortable and tolerable. And like that becomes, preserving that becomes like really, really psychologically important, right? So yeah. then if something comes along that doesn't work, with that lens, people naturally reject it and like push back really, really hard because it's not like, it's not because they're inherently like bad, but it's because it's too much. It's like asking people to give up the thing that makes them feel comfortable and like safe. And I think that that was really well shown because I think that like the siblings, once they finally were able to like accept but that what Christian was saying was true. Like once they were able to believe it, they like, I think they, they kicked the dad out and they like read the thing and they started doing a little bit better, but like that resistance to it is so real, you know? Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. And I would say it is kind of, I'm sorry, Lexi, I can't go. No, no, no. That was it. I, I, you know, this is kind of a broad statement, but I think it's accurate. I think to be a, to be a really good writer, um, one of the characteristics, and and, and when I and I, I, I've never seen it fail, that you must have empathy. It's impossible to be a great writer or a good writer or a writer period to and not have empathy, not to say, okay, I know who you are. Um, I appreciate, even though I, I don't approve, or, and, and, but I understand how you got here. I mean, when you look at the great Russians and you look at <clears throat> Dostoevsky and, 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 and Tolstoy, um, you know, they, they have deep understanding of why their characters behave as they do. And I think this film captures, uh, as Alexei was just, you know, illustrating, which is really good, you know, why, <clears throat> excuse me, why, why they're behaving they you have to know and the only way you can know a character in a very deep way is to empathize with them you know actors many actors will tell you you know that when they're paying, playing somebody who's a really is a bad person they understand the motivation and to that to them that's it's not a bad person it's somebody whose motivation comes from a very pure place and that's why Amelia uh, Clark struggled so much with the end of Game of Thrones <laughs> because she was like, I can't track this. Yeah. And <laughs> but if yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you're writing a character and you and you can you can condemn that character, but you don't empathize with that character, you don't understand the character, then the audience are gonna look at that person and say, like, oh, they're the other, like other people do that stuff. But I think mm -hmm. in this movie, a lot of people saw themselves. Yeah. What's in re was he saying only a few of the actors knew what what's this say? So in the film, Henrik was saying that apparently oh, oh, while they were shooting this film, when Christian was gonna give up get up to give his toast to the father, only oh. a few actors in the room knew what it was gonna be about. Oh no shit, really? Which no, is really? Oh. Wow, yeah. that's pretty great. By the way, 
And right, do you know most of these? I, I think you said you know these actors. Yeah, he so. said, he said, yeah, earlier he did. They're like, tell us strong. more, Enrique. Tell us all the yeah, behind the scenes tell us, details. Yes, what, what? If so, real quick, if Adam was here, he would go. He would talk to us about radical empathy. That's his. That's his phrase <laughs> that he uses. Is yeah. like saying that writers need to be able to have radical empathy for every single character in the right. film. If the audience I, can't I see themselves in the characters who are being sort of positioned as the, the bad people, then they can't learn from them because they like, I don't have that problem. I'm, I'm not them. There are other people. But if you create that empathy, if you can, and in this, in this kind of movie, you want to make that really uncomfortable empathy. It's like, Oh no, I see myself in them. Have I, have I done that? Do would I do that? I think, I guess I, I probably would if I was in that situation. Like it's such an uncomfortable thing to be confronted with. But that's what stories are here for, right? They're to help us grow as as humans. Mm -hmm. So Mike says, can we discuss the ending? WTF is with the dad's final line. Is that the line where he says, like, you fought well? You fought, you fought, you fought well. a good fight, I think. Yeah, something like that, yeah. That was horrible. Yeah. I'm just like, get out. You could, like... And what, what, what a... <laughs> What a, a climax also, right? That is that is the villain losing the final fight there. Yeah. Good Lord. It's beautiful. You put it's up a good he's, fight. He's what the escorted out of the out of his own building. Oh, and Did by you? the way, when when Michael loses it and beats up his father, um it, that, that just struck me as so real also of like if you've if you feel like you've been you've been pushing away a truth for so long and then you can't deny it anymore you explode at the cause of that. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's like, I can't believe that you made me defend you. I can't square that in my own head. You are such a must have to destroy you. It all comes out at once. Which, I, yeah, I think that that makes a lot of, I mean, like, yeah, it's like how dare you, you strung me along. Like you made yeah. me complicit in this and yeah. then exploded. But yeah, that stupid line. That was like one of those <laughs> lines though, that felt right. Like it like felt like something that douchebag would say. And it was just like, you know, it was like. He's trying to preserve a little bit of dignity somehow. Oh God, Lexi, <laughs> like he's trying so to be intent. like, ugh, I know, I do get, I do. But it's just like, it felt like such a condescending, like him trying to cling to like a little bit of a, like power, like to the Higher power ground. structure by being like, okay, like a little son, like, yeah, you did, you did good. Like you, you know, it was him. I think it was him clinging to right. power and trying to right. like. I am the yeah. arbiter of such things, and I've decided. And I can want. still qualify. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I allow you to win. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, and that's so true to character. It's just he's a yeah. bastard to the end. God, that scene where he's gaslighting, where, where he's threatening him, also like, sh should I tell them about all the ways that you're problematic and all the all of your struggles and like, all the things? You think he was so problematic, God. you douche. So like, <laughs> but also the movie has so much to say about power structures. Cause I'm thinking about yes, how like yes. the people in the kitchen all know, and they're all willing to, you know, help the way they can, but they can't be the ones who say he did this thing. Cause then they'll just be fired. And that's that they're like, they don't have that power. All they can do is hope that somebody with you know, something even close to power, like maybe his son, maybe would have some impact if he had the correct words. And that's that's part of why I think it's so great that the sister reads the letter. Because even if Kristen read the letter um, and had the letter and said, this is proof, at that point, everyone's so invested in him as being unreliable, you know, mm -hmm. because he's lost the power there that if he ever had any. That's God. how stuff like Harvey Weinstein happens, though, you know, like, yeah. like yeah. everybody knew. Yeah. Everybody that's effing that's knew. That's and but, like, and it took, a, it took like, you, decades yeah of people and then people having to come forward and then having stuff like this that we saw in the 90 minutes happen to them like where you know the gaslighting and like the people just being like no it didn't happen and like how dare you and like all that it took all of that and then it took people like the the fact that she read the letter i think i can see why dramatically that was not the most like i can see why it was not the most dramatic choice for the protagonist to have somebody else read the letter but I think in terms of realism, having her read the letter is like exactly yeah. what Avi was saying. I think it's exactly correct. And once yeah. they couldn't and once they couldn't deny it anymore, a lot of Michaels beat up their mm -hmm. father, Harvey Weinstein, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. how dare you make me part of you all yeah. the time? 
all these people right. being like trying to cut ties now. And it's kind of like, well, you know, you're a little like. You were in denial, but you were there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If this were a studio film, there would have been a, there would have been a conversation and I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain it never happened, but there would have been a conversation. Does he apologize? Somebody else brought this up, which is smart, you know, that he did, but because this guy and Mike said, yes, he doesn't apologize. He's always a monster. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, so it would be, it'd be a false note. And that's what's so tricky about being a writer and understanding character. What is the false, when is it false? And having an ear or an understanding for character so that you know, oh, this is false. Um, and you may not know it on the first draft. You may write that first draft and, and you're, you're thinking too much about the audience. What does the audience expect? And that's a whole other conversation. But what is the true response reaction for the character? And, and you will get to a point that you know your character so well that you know, you know this guy does not correct. He cannot. He's on his way to continue to be a monster. Yeah, yeah. A diminished monster, but a monster. Marco yeah. says, um, I'm "Sorry, if I'm pronouncing yes. your name wrong, please let me know, and I will do it better next time." This is a good um, note. I think the father is trying to take away the son's victory by claiming it as his own. Yes. And the son finally being able to stand up for himself as a result of the father's education. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. that's At exactly. Left, I'm proud. That's of that. absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. it's God. that's exactly it, and. Yeah, I'm impressed. I'm impressed by this film. So, like, a lot of times you try to write movies that are about like difficult things, and you run into the situation like where people are like, "This doesn't work," and you're like, "But this is what really happens," and it's really, and you know, like, like it doesn't work story wise, but you like know that this is like what really happens, and so, and it's difficult to get those two things to go together, like to have something that really happens work dramatically. Um. And I people, was impressed that this did. Well, I think yeah. part of part By the way, of what people was so behave much. counterintuitively. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, people. Yeah. I mean, when I, when, I, when I saw that that scene where Christian comes out and says, "Oh, and you, you know, horribly abused me and my sister," like I did basically like a spit take, like, "Oh my god!" And then when everybody didn't react to it, I actually rebound a little bit just to make sure I read it correctly the first time in the subtitles. Um, and I think part of why it works so well, even though like it strikes you as counterintuitive of like, how could they do that? Is because it's portrayed as this just wild thing of like, and then can you believe they continued having their party as opposed to- I if love they, that. Like, if, like they could have, like there, there's a version of this movie that could have tried to sneak it by you of like, and then they kept having the party and so on. And then you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Here it's like, but yeah, it, does. it doesn't make sense. Let's spotlight the fact it doesn't make sense. We are staring at this in the face like let's discuss this insane thing, you know. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and part and, and I saw some back and forth in the comments about um, why when, at the end when they kick out the father, why do they let the mother stay? And I think part of it is if they start drawing lines of who is complicit and who isn't, everybody leaves the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah like the brother just beat this guy up. The brother just beat up Christian. So if now they have to kick, like I mean, they were ready to accept one truth. Like yeah. maybe the dad is bad, but that's a whole different level than they don't want to look at themselves. No, like at least that they're able to separate from themselves. But if they start saying like, okay, the mom too, then it's like, okay. then the brother who didn't believe them, then the kitchen staff who didn't say anything. And then like, you know, it it's everyone. And they I think that's a great yeah. point. They won't challenge the power structure, but they'll cut out the one thing that they could definitely identify as bad and then say, Oh, we did it. Great. Move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean that, you know, again, I'm sorry to go back to this, but you know, that, that kind of understanding of character, part of it comes with age, you know, that you, you begin to understand people so well and you know, been around a long time, been right a long time. You uh, understand that, that, that uh, people contradict themselves and, um, and in that contradiction is actually the truth. Yeah. Um, and that's why uh, Abishai, I don't like to even laugh at this, but that's, you know, I always too often talk about this, that wonderful bo moment when, when, when the doctor tells Walter White, you've got cancer, inoperable. And Walter's response, Avi, Walter's response is, 
I'll remember it. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Alexi, you might, or maybe I haven't told the story, but Walter's response is- You have responses, mustard on your shirt. You have mustard on your lapel. You know- And you just go, holy shit. And the doc, even the doctor says, do you understand what I just said? He says, yes, but you, you've got mustard right, right there on your lapel. So that is a true reaction to learning you're gonna die. You know, I, I, I went to this show once, this comedy show that I cannot get out of my head when it comes to writing, where it was in two parts. One, the first part was this sort of physical comedy. It's very, it was, there was no dialogue of any kind, just one, one person show, but it's like slapstick. And it was incredibly funny. Like this, there, I can't tell you for the life of me what the story was, but I just remember it just being really funny with not a single line. And then the second half was he gave, basically gave us a lecture about how to do physical comedy. And the thing that he kept getting back to is, how do you play drunk? Do you like trying, trying so, to uh, act sober? Yeah, trying to act sober, exactly. That's and, right. and that's writing too. Hmm. If if there is something that your character is, you know, is experiencing that is sort of something that they don't want to let on, what you show them do is compensate. That's right. Right. That's right. That's and that's right. what this whole movie is, you know. That's right. And it's uh, it's it. it, it I, I think that might be one of one of the big lessons in scene. That's writing, a great, to be honest. Yeah, that's yeah. I, I didn't mean. I'm sorry. I stepped on your line there. But I've heard. You know, I know that that that's a good actor is trying to be trying to trying to act sober. Yeah, that's and that's you know what 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 your character is dealing with in the scene. They are trying to act sober. That is that is always yes. boom. Yeah. yeah, Walter White is <laughs> trying to act sober. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, a hundred percent. Here's some more. We did get some fun facts from Henrik. Oh, good. Uh, Henrik, he knows his, yeah. Yeah. Thomas Bo Larson, Michael, can't read. So he gets his lines on an audio tape where his wife reads them out loud for them. Wait a minute. He can't read? Seriously? Isn't that I mean, interesting? Of course it's serious. I mean, to find him. Really? Oh. And then there was other things about like that he, he wanted to minimize, Henrik said earlier that um, they wanted to minimize the amount of extras in the room. So I the camera this. operators were part of the party people. Oh, wow. Hey, what a brilliant choice. Oh my God. It's so oh, smart. Man. Oh, by the way, just a, a, a small sort of subplot that I think is so lovely and it could have fallen apart, but it, it's so lovely that demonstrates Christian's arc is he starts off the story as clearly having an inability to like create a romantic connection with anybody. You know, it's it's far reaching back for obvious reasons, for dramatic reasons. The very end of the movie, he just looks at, at what was it Pia? Is that her name? And yeah. says, would you like to move to Paris with me? And she says, yes. And it's such a small moment, but that's his entire arc right there. That's him. Yes, that's, it is. That's, that's him yes, it letting is. go of something. Yes, it is. Yes. Oh, and by the way, John, there was a thing you were saying several times throughout the, the summary that really made me think. Um, where you said his goal is kill dad. And... I think it's fascinating because like, obviously he's not trying to kill dad. He doesn't have a serrated knife or a gun or anything like that's against dogma, but there's a Jewish line. I think, I, I think it's from the Mishnah that basically says like, like he who um, whitens the face, like embarrasses his friend in front of others. Um, it is as if he has committed murder. Um, say that again. Say that again. It's, it? it's, I'm trying to remember the exact translation, but something along the lines of he who, whitens the face of his peer in front of a crowd. Like whitens his face like humiliates uh, in front of a crowd. It is as if he has committed murder. And that's what this movie is. Remember at the end, yes. the, like, cause it's a slow death for the father. Like every, every attack that Chris Christian does, it's like, oh, he attacked us. Like that doesn't kill him, but like, it's like, oof, I, you know, he feels that and he, he has to like deal with it. And every single subsequent one that he has to do that. And then when he, after he's been beaten up by Michael, there's a great line where he's in the grass. He says, you're killing me. You're killing me. Right. They are destroying him systematically. And it makes me think about how the stakes in a story, even when they're not life or death are life or death. But and by the way, mm -hmm. um, I, I would, I would suggest that the stakes are higher in this film than if he had a serrated knife, if yeah. he was literally going to kill him. The stakes are higher because he's going he's gonna to kill him and leave him to live with it. Yeah. And yeah. the irony and the pain of that is, is perhaps, you, you know, worse than, yeah. This is, this is part of yeah. why I, in my own writing, I've sort of been moving away from 
redemptive self-sacrifice where a sort of somebody commits a crime and then eventually has to like, you know, sacrifice their life for redemption. Because I, I, I've sort of reached this point where th that's easy. The really hard thing is to try to keep making it right. Um, but just with regarding stakes, personal is always going to work better than scale. I don't care about the fate of the universe or whatever. I care about the fate of a person. Yep. Yeah. And and that's that. I mean, well, I'm, I got I to tell you, I'm sure because I, I when I told my wife, I'm going to do a celebration in a coffee class, she said, oh, my God, they're going to hate that. And I, I, she said, you know, why would you torture everybody? But um, it seems many of you have, have, have responded to it. And, and I, again, it's, I think it's important to see the film and, and uh, it's great characters. Uh, it's, you know, it's, yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's, so, it's 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 something. A you know, it's a swing. Uh, well, and a thank you. Yeah, but it, you know, also th this kind of deep understanding of character is what we all aspire to. I mean, I think one of the reasons that we're you know that we're writers is that um, there's nothing more complex and interesting than human nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it because you can never solve it. You can never, but but it's always fascinating. Yeah. When I heard what this was about, I was like, crap. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I I really appreciate it as a film and like as like a and like looking at human nature. I think it was a really good pick. I was pleasantly surprised at how it was handled. <laughs> I mean, it's such a is, difficult is thing here. to handle. Yeah. You know? Like it it's like it's it's <laughs> I feel like it's like watching like two cars like nearly crap like you know you're like expecting a train wreck and then i think yeah. it oh yeah i think it handled at home. <laughs> very tight rope walk like yeah, yeah it it was good though yeah um well i when think you, I, I wasn't uh, i didn't mean to be pushing for compliments it's just i was wary and i know it's it's demanding material but yeah, yeah. like anyway, when, but, when you tell a story about something as touchy as this and all the there's so much touchy as this stuff throughout it. There's, there's obviously there's the childhood trauma and the rape and me too and racism and all these things. If you're not authentic with it completely, then the whole thing's going to collapse like a house of cards. Like it, it, a single misstep could completely undo a story like this. Like you really got to know what you're doing. And by the way, I would, I would hate for like, all movies to be like this movie, but this, yeah. but we need yeah, that. We, do, we need, you, yeah. but no, you, you need a balance. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But this movie aims high, and I think it 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 hits the bullseye. And thank God, because right next to that bullseye was a a vat of propane, and <laughs> <laughs> it could have been really bad for everybody involved. That's a good way to put it. So, yeah. real quick, I want to talk about what's happening next week. Two things. First off, we are opening up writing the feature again on Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, it's gonna be open for, we decided to extend it. It's gonna be open for a full week for enrollment. So you have a week to enroll. We're taking our second class, the spring 2021 class. So if you've been curious about it, you should um, check out some uh, links in the description. It's really cool. It's a big class with John, me and Adam talking about feature writing. Um, and it'll take you from like, nothing like no idea to a finished feature screenplay in 10 weeks and creating it taught me a lot about screenwriting that I thought I already knew so I feel like there's a lot of good stuff in there that hopefully is helpful and if you come into the discord you can talk to people who have done it see if it was oh, good right, for them yeah. if you haven't tried our free courses try that first and see if like the way we teach is fits the way you learn um but yeah I would definitely recommend considering that and then next week, I'm very excited that we have a guest coming on. Uh, her name is Hannah. I don't want to pronounce her last name Barbikov. wrong, but Barbakov. Hannah Barbakov. Yeah. Nice. And she was one of John's students a few years. We didn't overlap, but a few years before me, a few years before Avi. And um, she sold a short digital series, which is really cool. She just finished shooting a pilot that they're shopping around right now that she's down to show us. And she created a really cool app called Flick. That's like a community for people to talk about like what, what stuff they're watching, like films that they're watching. And my favorite feature is that it 
tells you where you can watch them, which is such an annoying thing yeah. to have to dig up on yeah. your own to be like, is this on Netflix? Is it on Hulu? Is it nowhere? Like what's so, um, yeah, if you, if you're on our page, you can see that we have created like the listing for that. And there's tons of links there and I'll email more out and post them in the discord, but that's going to be a great one. I met her yesterday, yeah. John. She's very. Oh, you did. I'm glad. I'm glad you're bringing her on. She's really. She's nice. terrific. Hannah's Hannah's yeah. fantastic. I, I adore her. And Hannah, we'll we'll get into this next week, but real quickly, uh, Hannah went to Los Angeles and um, um, tried the LA scene and and uh, had a manager and worked with people and um, had a little. I think I could I would say this if she were here, and I'll say it next week. She had a little trouble finding her voice which you're going to be surprised because when you see her series, she's locked the voice in. She's got a great voice and she was playing with, we can, maybe she should talk about this. She was, she was trying different voices and it took her a while to find her own. And, and, and now she certainly has it and it's unique and it's fantastic. Very funny. Um, she, yeah, yeah, she does like the writing, directing, acting thing. And yeah. I was talking yeah. to her. I'm yeah, like, that's so right. she writes, directs, and stars in this yeah. series. And it yeah. was funny because I was like, "Did you always want to act?" And she was like, "No, not at all." But it felt like a necessary evil because no one else could get my awkward right. And I freaking love that. Question, here. <laughs> Michelle, you're <laughs> so <laughs> provocative. Look at that, Michelle's question. Oops, John, who's your favorite student you ever had? Well, God, oh my God, we've run out of time. <laughs> look, at, look, at, look at the hour. Next look time, come back hour. with an ordered list. Uh. <laughs> oh man you have a lot of fun like i've liked all of your students that you, that I, you like. I adore my students i adore my students i mean even the ones even the ones who go yeah i i yeah uh mr warren i don't do it that way i don't i i got another way of doing it great uh, great <laughs> yeah that was gonna be a fun class we're gonna talk about so like if you're interested in creating your own original like writing a digital series or a series overall writing directing shooting it um she did cool stuff like fundraised it and it's yeah, just there's a lot of great. really great yeah there's a lot of really hey, great Alexi, insights in are there. we gonna see what are we gonna do we're we gonna see some of it before, during the yeah. room well so, so i was we'll gonna watch some of it in class huh yeah the the pilot's a bit long because it's like a pilot it's like a 30 minute pilot mm -hmm. but we All could right. watch um watch the first we could watch some of her shorter ones in class. We can do that. Yeah, why don't we do that? We'll talk to her and see what she's comfortable with. But we're going to watch some of the material, and she's going to talk about how she created it, how she came up with it, how she writes, stars, and, and directs. Yeah. And she's funny as hell. She's very funny. She's very funny, and she's very nice. It's a good combo. <laughs> she's not that nice. I say no, all this. No, kidding. She is very nice. I say all this she's after She's the nicest student I've ever time. had. Nicest? Nicest student you ever had? Oh my God, we've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys. That was fun. All right. Thank you. See you next All week. Right. See you yeah. next week. Thanks. Thanks.